I appreciate this opportunity from Dr. Class and the Brazil Studies Program uh, to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in the Amazon forest using an unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone. Uh, we collaborate uh, closely with uh, Arizona State University and a team of PhD students from and undergraduates from uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University and Arizona State University has been carrying out over the past few years uh, several sets of very interesting uh, and important experiments. Um, we've been using uh, a, a UAV uh, about, uh, has carrying capacity of about five uh, kilograms, takeoff weight about 20 kilograms. It's a, about an arm's length, so uh, maybe at full span, uh, about uh, a meter and a half gives you an idea of the size. And we've been flying it in different uh, locations. Um, one of our favorite locations is a tower. Uh, that is in uh, a botanical garden, a reserve, north of the city of Manaus, the Duque Reserve. Um, and from that tower, we fly the UAV horizontally over the forest. Um, and what we're doing, we stay about 10 meters above the forest. What we're doing is we have chemical sensors on board that take in organic compounds. These are the types of things your nose responds to as perfumes and so on and so forth. But the plants are always emitting these organic compounds and they use them for a number of purposes. Uh, for example, uh, they will attract uh, uh, counter predators. So if one insect starts to eat on the plant's leaves, the plant will emit a certain compound that will attract another predator to take care of the first predator. Um, they are also using them in uh, response to uh, drought and flood as ways to uh, maintain energy balance and uh, carbon balance um, and a number of other uh, things that are going on. But this is kind of a world of invisible communication. We as human beings are doing a lot with our ears and our eyes, but uh, plants are and the larger uh, tie-ins with uh, insects and other animals, a very vibrant world of organic chemical communication going on in the forest. And so we use this unmanned aerial vehicle to go over the forest and what we call sniffing the forest or smelling the forest um, and learning about this communication and what it means, especially as the forest continues to change under stresses from uh, evolving climate. Um, to what extent are the smells, the chemicals that the forest is giving off indicators of that change, a warning system for that change? Um, and, and how can we anticipate a forest is currently changing and might be changing uh, again in, in the future. Um, this is a project that's had very important uh, 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 results. Um, in uh, kind of another project, two, we've had a total, I guess, of three, three projects over maybe three years in our, in our collaboration uh, uh, with uh, Amazon State University and, and several PhD theses uh, coming out of both Harvard and Amazon State. Uh, in that collaboration. Um, the, uh, another thing we've done is in the urban center, we have been flying a UAV up and down, um, uh, going to heights above the buildings and then coming down and doing this at night um, from, uh, uh, and this is giving us profiles, profiles of the pollution in the urban boundary layer at night, then above that urban boundary layer, then back down. And that way we've been learning about uh, how uh, the emissions of uh, 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 the nighttime rush hour traffic are affecting urban health. We've also been observing, again, chemical sensing. A lot of, a lot of applications with drones, right, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, are with uh, cameras. In our cases, they're with chemical sensors. So in this case, instead of smelling the forest, the organic molecules, we're looking at an important uh, pollutant, uh, ozone, um, this is uh, a human produced uh, pollutant, but it also when it hits the forest, the leaves, they're coated with oils and things, uh, they, uh, the ozone reacts. And so what you have at nighttime is you have overlying ozone left from the day's pollution and photochemistry that should have a gradient down to the surface where it's zero when it hits the plant surface. Um, and so if you have a nice nighttime quiescent, not too many winds, um, the type of profile that you see in a textbook. There's uh, no ozone at the surface, it's straight up. When you hit the top of the mixing boundary layer at say 150 meters, then you have a, a quick change and a lot more ozone. So to what extent is the actual nighttime ozone profile, this uh, 
no ozone to the top of the boundary layer, 100, 150 meters, uh, and then lots of ozone. And by the way, what's that height? Is it really 100, 150 meters? That's what the textbooks tell us, but there are not a lot of textbooks that have studied the, the kind of tropical forest environment. And so we were able to find two things uh, in a series of about 80 nighttime flights. We were able to find uh, two things. One thing uh, we were able to find was the actual nighttime boundary layer height and how it varied from 100 to 300 meters among different nights. The other thing that's very interesting is we were able to see turbulence or injection of ozone, when instead of having this quiescent, no winds, uh, every once in a while you have a shearing layer up at 200 meters, and this would lead to eddies that would turbulently bring down the ozone to the surface. And that kind of mixing is very important at night for trying to renew polluted urban air with, with fresh air. So understanding the dynamics of that in uh, urban area of Manaus, uh, you know, it's at the equator, two million people, um, and what that means, how that meteorology ties in and what that means for, for human health. Um, and a third uh, application that we've been uh, doing recently, we had a boat. So uh, we were launching the uh, drone from the boat in the middle of, uh, uh, of a large river, um, uh, six kilometers across uh, is the width of the river. We were doing that uh, downwind of the urban pollution area of Manaus. And what happens over these large rivers is that the river during the day is cold. It's a thermal reservoir of water. And the nearby forest is getting warmed by uh, the sun. It's dark, it's green. And so what happens is over the forest, you get buoyant air, it's warmed. It goes up and then it comes over the river and circulates back down. So you get a daytime circulation pattern. And at night, it's the opposite. The river stays relatively warm and the, 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 the forest uh, cools faster and the circulation goes the other way. Now our studies were in the middle of the afternoon. And the question is, from the pollution coming out of uh, uh, the city of Manaus, um, in principle, if it's coming out and then uh, gets uh, lifted, and then it can recirculate back to the city of Manaus. So how you get with what we call this river breeze, this circulation with these large rivers, how that ties in to pollution dispersion from, from an urban uh, area. Um, this was very interesting because you know, river breezes uh, uh, have not been well studied. Um, they're hard to study. Uh, uh, you, if you have a boat, uh, you can't really put up a tower in the middle of the river. And if you try to do an aircraft, uh, you're flying around at say 500 meters. And so there's this really missing gap from uh, zero to 500 meters. Where we just don't have a lot of information. Um, and so launching the drone, uh, outfitting both with chemical sensors for the pollution and meteorological sensors, wind speed, wind direction. Um, this allowed us to collect profiles where we could characterize the circulation. And then with chemical measurements, we could connect it over uh, to, uh, to the urban center and the dispersion of, uh, of uh, pollution in a way that's never really been done uh, before. And so this was a very important uh, result because, of course, most of the people in uh, northern Brazil uh, have settled and live along uh, rivers. And so the coupling between pollution and these river breezes is really unexplored, but quite important for human health uh, in, in, in the region. And so in some kind of through these three projects, I uh, hope you get a sense of how this emerging technology of, uh, uh, of drones is allowing us to do things in the atmospheric sciences, atmospheric chemistry, that before we really couldn't do. Um, towers were uh, important, but one local position. Aircraft were higher flying and faster. And between those two limits, we have this new platform. And so we're able to really tackle a lot of important uh, questions for climate, environment, and human health in ways that have been uh, 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 impossible before.